Let's talk about cardiac auscultation. In this video, we'll discuss the various heart sounds, what they are and what creates them, as well as discussing where one can specifically auscultate or listen for the functioning of the different valves. So heart sounds are audible occurrences that result from cardiogenic events, and it's usually the sound of blood doing something. So there are two large categories here. There are primary heart sounds and secondary heart sounds. Primary heart sounds are the classic lub-dub, or the The lub is what we would call S1, sound one, the dub S2, sound two. Now, I really like this particular illustration that relates heart sounds to what is happening with the heart. So in green, we have what's occurring with ventricular pressure, in yellow, atrial pressure, and then in red, aortic pressure. So let's take a look here. So just after T0, we see an elevation first in atrial pressure and then in ventricular pressure that is commensurate with that atrial pressure increase. So what's going on here is atrial systole. So the atria are contracting and as they contract, that gets to the end of ventricular filling so that they're ejecting uh, approximately about a quarter of the total volume of blood that the ventricles are going to receive in a cardiac cycle. So following that, we're going into a period of ventricular systole. And as ventricular pressure rapidly rises, one of the first events is the closure of those atrioventricular valves. Blood pushes against the valve cusps. They're held uh, very tightly by the cordy tendony and the, the papillary muscles that are also contracting to tug on those cordy tendony. And as a result, the valve cusps are brought into close approximation for closure. As the valves close, ventricular pressure rises quickly. So that pushes blood out through the semilunar valve, so aortic and pulmonic, into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. As pressure increases, 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 and then as pressure reaches a maximum and starts to decrease again, the blood that's in the pulmonary trunk and aorta can begin to move backwards towards the heart. Now when that happens, the blood is caught by the cusps of the semilunar valves, causing those semilunar valve cusps to close or to come into approximation, and there's, there's turbulence there. Then ventricular pressure declines, 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 and we enter into a period of diastole. That's when both the atria and the ventricles are relaxed and those AV valves open wide again and blood rushes through into the, the ventricles. And then diastole is fo followed again by atrial systole. It's an ongoing process with a lot of luck. And so what is heard as S1 and S2 or the lub-dub is blood turbulence as valves are closing. S1 relates to the closure of the atrioventricular valves. S2 relates to the closure of the semilunar valves. Now the secondary heart sounds aren't always heard, um, and when they're heard, they're not always bad. Um, sometimes they, they can be benign, um, especially in children, as is largely the, the rule for heart murmurs. So for secondary sounds, we have S3 and S4 sounds. So there's S3 and I've added S4 there. So let's remember what's going on during these times. So S3 is during diastole, whereas S4 is during 
atrial systole. So with S3, the AV valves are wide open, the atria and the ventricles are relaxing, and blood is rushing in through the atria, through the AV valves, and into the ventricles. And what is heard in S3 is that turbulence of blood as it's filling the ventricles. This is a very common sound heard in children and is generally quite benign. Now this order, S1, S2, S3, has a cadence to it. It's called a gallop. Um, oftentimes uh, people refer to it as a Kentucky gallop because the cadence of Kentucky explains the cadence of those sounds. So Kentucky is how the S3 sound blends in with S1 and S2. Now S4, if it's present, it's a very rare sound to hear, occurs during atrial systole. So the atria are contracting and blood is being forced into the ventricles. And so ventricular pressure increases a little, but S4 is generally heard when the walls of the ventricle aren't compliant. They're not stretching to accommodate that blood. It might be because, um, you know, there's hy uh, a hypertrophy of the wall, right? It might be cardiomegaly uh, for some pathological reason. Now, S4 precedes S1 and S2. So when heard, it's S4, S1, S2, or the, the cadence would be Tennessee, Tennessee. like that. Now a murmur um, can be anything else that that isn't typical. So a clicking sound, a gurgling sound, a whooshing or a rushing sound. Um, generally, not always, but generally uh, murmurs tend to be quite benign in children um, and if caught in adults can, can be indicative of valvular disorders. But so they, they could be benign or not, but uh, it, it's important that uh, that a murmur is is fully evaluated to make that determination by the physician. So the heart can be auscultated from a number of different positions, but the valves have very particular places um, on the on the thorax to best listen to them or auscultate them. So it's, it's probably best to understand that um, wherever a heart valve projects to the, the, the sternum or the ribs isn't where you listen to it. So for instance, you know, this is approximately the location of the aortic valve. <clears throat> Yet you would not <clears throat> place the bell of a stethoscope there to auscultate the aortic valve. Rather, <clears throat> you would place the bell of a stethoscope um, in a in the path of blood in an area that is unencumbered by bone. So if this is the valve, you take you know a, a right angle here, you go perpendicular to follow the path of blood out. And once you're clear of the sternum is where you would auscultate. In the case of the aortic valve, it's the right second intercostal space right at the sternal border. For the pulmonary valve, it would be the left second intercostal space at the sternal border, but also you can try the third intercostal space. Notice these intercostal spaces are named for the ribs above them. So the second intercostal space is between second and third, the third intercostal space between third and fourth. In the cases of the atrioventricular valves, the blood is moving inferiorly and laterally to the left. And so for the tricuspid valve, one would listen first or first attempt auscultation in the left fifth intercostal space just off the sternal border. If unsuccessful, you could also try the fourth intercostal space 
or the sternal angle there. So this is quite a, a variable range of locations to auscultate the tricuspid valve. In the case of the bicuspid valve, the auscultation point is pretty close to the sternocostal projection for the apex of the heart. You want to take about a midclavicular line and go in the fifth intercostal space along that midclavicular line for the bicuspid or the mitral valve on, on the left side. So the mnemonic here is apartment B, so aortic pulmonary, uh, tricuspid, and then bicuspid or mitral. So you can do apartment M as well. And that leads us to our assessment question for the video, and that is, when auscultating the aortic valve, the bell of the stethoscope should be placed where? So if we think about the aortic valve, the aortic valve is projecting blood upwards and to the right, and so it's sitting generally about in the third intercostal space, so one would look in the second intercostal space on the right hand side just at the sternal border. So A would be the correct answer. B, the second to third intercostal space just right of the sternum. That sounds more like the pulmonary valve. C, the fourth or fifth intercostal space just left of the sternum. That's the tricuspid valve and D, the fifth intercostal space along the left midclavicular line, that would be the bicuspid or mitral valve. Thank you very much for your time.